Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, so we'll kick off the panel by having everyone do a brief introduction of what they've been doing with games. So you want to start? Oh, um, I thought Emily was next. Okay, Emily can I'm start. I'm happy to start. Um, hi, I'm Emily. I work at the San Mateo County Office of Education right now. Um, my background is in AI and in game development. So I was an indie game developer. Um, I made uh, hand-illustrated games about spelling and depression. Um, I won the 2013 BAFTA uh, for Best Game in Scotland. And um, through that, I've started getting into making games for kids to hack and to play. And basically, game dev was my in into education. And um, I want to educate the next generation of game developers so that I have better games to play when I retire. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Eric Brown. My game background is I started a company called Impact Games. We made a game called Peacemaker about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Heard it. Some of this I've done. Um, I got into games not intentionally, but I went to Carnegie Mellon University's Entertainment Technology Center, um, and that's where that project began, which is also where I came in contact with Randy Pausch. And so when Wanda Dan retired, I was recruited to lead our Alice. So now I am. Alice and so doing sort of more the direct education of using technology for good, not the making games for good, um, but I believe in both. And so that's a little bit of that. Jan? Hi everybody. Um, my name is Jan Plass. I'm at New York University and I'm a researcher um, running a lab called CREATE, a consortium for research and evaluation of advanced technologies in education. And together with Ken Perlin, I co-direct the Games for Learning Institute. And so we've done research on and with games and on and with coding off and on since, since 2005 when we started with uh, Mary Flanagan's project uh, uh, where we had a, a, a game to, to teach middle school youth and particularly girls how to code. And so it's been a number of different projects where sometimes coding was in the forefront, sometimes the game design was in the forefront. Uh, right now we're thinking about a game to teach AI and allow uh, students to code in an Alice style and a kind of block language style um, within the game. Uh, so it's, it's been a topic uh, near and dear to my heart um, and mostly though from a research perspective because we always are interested in what are the outcomes of that. Uh, because I believe uh, uh, strong practitioners need strong researchers as partners to actually showcase what comes out of those projects um, to go for the next round of funding at the very least, or to at least see what, uh, what the impact was. Um, I'm Tiffany Barnes. I also do work in games, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my background in that too. I'm a professor of computer science, and I'm also on the research side of using games, so I've been having college students make games, uh, many of them making serious games or educational games and researching whether they actually uh, impacted the learning objectives that were targeted. Uh, we've also made some social and exercise games. Um, and I started doing the work as a way to get uh, different kinds of people interested in uh, computer science. And then uh, just loved working on the games uh, with the students because that creative process, I think, is what engages lots of different people. And that's why we're on this panel today because I think all of us believe that uh, game design is a place where we can be uh, inclusive. And um, so actually, I'd like to uh, turn that back over to the panel as a question. So what is it about game design? So it's not just coding, right? What is it do you think that gets people um, excited about doing it? So I think fundamentally, games are narrative. Um, but the advantage that they have engagement-wise over a book or a comic book or something is that they, they are interactive as well. So you're not only writing you know, from the first person or third person, you're writing essentially from the second person. It's you, the player, is now taking on this persona, this identity. And so kids or anyone writing a game, they get, to, they get to express their point of view and how they see the world through building a world that the player will then engage with. So the player you know, goes through a world, makes choices. Those choices have consequences. And then there are also all, all of these elements like what is your goal, your motivation, how do you interact with the world? If you make a game where the main way of the player's interaction with the world is with a gun, like that is one type of worldview. But then how are the other ways you can interact with the world? What do you see as your powers? And so it's really getting, getting people to express their own identity and their own stories in this interactive way that really builds empathy. I think a lot of kids, it just blows their minds that they can 
you know, essentially make something that, has, it, that communicates their experience in an interactive way to other people. Yeah, for me, uh, one of the main reasons why we find the game so appealing is the playfulness factor. Um, much of learning is not playful, and there is no real reason why. Um, when, when I give talks about games and learning, there's kind of always a split in the audience when, when it's an uninitiated audience. So some people saying, oh, yes, we have to do that. And sometimes when I get back home to my uh, home country of Germany, uh, I get a response that says, well, but if everything is fun in games, then what will happen when they finally hit college and it's not anymore? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm only saying that because those people exist in this country as well, or they exist everywhere, right? There's this deep suspicion that if it's not serious, how can we learn something from it? And so to me, that playfulness combined with the fact that um, games are, are rather ill-defined. We have a couple of things that we say makes it a game, but other than that, it could be anything. And so that means you could take any particular role within the design process that is really near and dear to your heart. You can be the graphics designer, you can be the, uh, the, the, the writer, you can be the coder, you, you know, and, and there's so many other things, there's the sound design, um, that all pulls people in and then you have this shared outcome. Right? And that is so exciting, where the coding part is just one part, but we engage on so many other levels. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I... Uh... I fully agree with both of those, so I'll try and add something else to it because the Games for Change side of me says that the first one there of NFT and all the things there and taking storytelling to another level. Uh, one thing I've been looking at lately that I think is another one is that this goes back to our Games for Change story was always everybody plays games now, here's the numbers, all those types of things. So it really is something that I would say more people play games now than read comic books and things like that. So the odds that they've at least played games. And then that really one of the things that I've been looking at for like adventure games and this tool that I've got some resumes making is that uh, games are really system thinking and so that plays really well. So even just giving kids homework that says you all play games, so tell me how you win your game, what are the mechanics of your game and things like that, you can get them into and then you can tell them that like all that stuff you just analyzed, like that's basic programming patterns. Now if you want to make the game or something like that. So there's some really interesting correlations there and so then the equity is really just that, I mean, find me a kid who you can't say, do you play a game and would you analyze that game? And so some of that. Yeah, I was on a panel back in like 2007 or something at uh, SIGGRAPH, and there were plenty of people in the audience who were like, you can't do computer science or AI and games at the same time. And I almost fell off my chair because I was like, you know, whenever I'm, I'm an AI person, and so I'm like the first idea I would ever have to teach AI to a student would be, Here's a non-player character. Figure out what they should do and program that. Um, so it's interesting to see that people who actually should know how a game might work uh, will say, that's not, that's not work. That's not serious. That's not uh, real. We can't do games and work at the same time. Um, but it's absolutely not true. Yeah, I always find that very ironic because chess. <laughs> Right. Just, just because chess, I mean, it's one of the most academic like disciplines someone would spend their time on. And it's a game, right? And it's one of the first things that AI really, you know, struggled with and, and bonded over. And it's a murderous game, right? Yes. Yes. So the whole idea of killing in games has been around for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just also want to mention that um, games actually are a great frame in education too though because um, we want students to do things that feel real um, but then they get very messy right and difficult to define well enough so that students know what to do um, and so games actually a really nice frame for doing things um, where you can you know make a boundary around what you're trying to do and have rules that are you know all set within the within the game um, so I think all of you have said something about um, that people can connect to game development. Um, does anybody want to add anything about social or emotional learning to that? Um, I mean, I'm always about games and empathy. And um, kind of there are multiple different opinions and um, ideas and, and ways to identify with how you're making the game. So for example, um, my fifth graders, did a project in, I, I don't teach in the classroom, but I go into classrooms where I'm needed. And so I convinced this teacher to forego the traditional book report 
for Banicula, and instead have the kids make the game of the book. And so I went into like three different sections, and they were all at a different phase of reading the book when they're starting making their game. And so we had the version, who is the hero? Right, find the textual reference to justify your hero. There's like three main characters in this. And everyone, it was basically equally distributed who everyone thought was the hero based on where they are in the book. Is it the narrator? Is it the protagonist? Is it the book, the bunny that the whole book is about? Like, and, and so then you're coming from different perspectives on that. And once you have the hero, you say, okay, what is the hero's goal? And also, depending on where they are in the book, they have a different understanding of where the goal is. But as long as they're able to give the textual reference to justify their thinking, that is valid. That's a valid choice. And so we have the game, and essentially, at the end of this, we had everyone had their different video game. And you could see like what part of the book it was from. And it had this kind of narrative flow that you could sort them. And, and I love just being able to see not only what the book was about, but what the kids thought about the book. Like what perspectives they, they were bringing from their own lives. Um, and that was just one of those cool things. Like, I wish every fifth grader had the experience to make the game a book. Because that's such a cool way to interpret stuff. I think um, one reason why I started working with games in computer science was um, to promote uh, communication and collaboration. Um, and I've recently been working on integrating computational thinking into uh, STEM classes. And you know, those are two of, the, two of the main things we're trying to do is, is communication and collaboration. Um, and I think that's particularly important for inclusion to emphasize that each person on the team needs to be able to communicate and collaborate with the other roles on the team. Um, Jan, would you like to say anything about that? Yeah, that would have been uh, absolutely my, my uh, primary reason why games are so interesting from, from that social emotional or, or dare I say 21st century skills. We call them learning and innovation skills uh, perspective. Um, it's the, the process of making the game and of thinking of the narrative and the empathy that might go into that is, is very well taken. I love that point. What we have observed with our um, middle school students who we taught, uh, or we didn't teach them, we, we facilitated a, a semester-long project where they learned game design and they built games uh, that they could pick the, you know, the topic about what they wanted to do, the genre and everything, um, was the group dynamics. What we saw in those groups, the way those, in this particular case, um, sixth grade girls, um, how they uh, um, formed into teams, broke apart, you know, worked through all the issues of life in a safe environment in a school and a team. And some teams came out much stronger, some teams learned a lot about themselves and realized that was not a good team configuration. But that kind of learning is, uh, was far more important in the end than the outcome. The games were great. Um, we actually, in that particular case, didn't focus on coding. We focused just on the design process and how they could pull math into that game. And then we had first playable productions up in Troy, New York, uh, build the prototype for the, um, for the winning group um, and build their game. And then they toured around and showed off their game where they said, look, we designed it. And we had a professional studio built it for us, uh, which was exciting because sometimes you get so stuck on the coding part that the other part suffers, especially if, if there's no experience. We've had the other way around. We had more, more coding uh, focused programs as well. But, uh, that was a particularly interesting one. And Eric, I was hoping you could tell us a little, a little bit about Games for Change and how you think that relates to motivation and um, getting different kinds of people involved. Yeah, I mean, we recently so are just doing sort of our first challenge um, in Pittsburgh with Alice. And my goal there was just to create materials that we could share out more because I was getting asked to judge sort of competitions in like Romania and random places like that. And so I was just trying to get some more structure so I would have something to help me when I'm trying to look at all these good books. And then part of it was almost to your point, you're in the realm of, I would see these games where it was sort of hard for me to tell whether they were anti-bullying or bullying games. And so part of me was just like, it's obviously anti-bullying. Somebody's just trying to voice their frustration through this thing. Um, but then the idea was that Alice is good for storytelling, Alice is good for sort of game making and things like that. But if you put those in the realm of like, well, let's have an animation competition or let's have a game competition, you really start pulling at, um, well, who A is competitive and B wants to tell a story that much or wants to make a game and things like that. And I guess just anecdotally, one other thing I've sort of come across has been the people that are really into games, that doesn't mean that they're going to be the one that wants to make games. 
they're probably the one that's like, yeah, no, I don't want to be a game maker. No, but you love playing games. So like the equity and audience that I think you're drawing with games and making games might surprise you in terms of like who it might bring to the table. Um, but then the other one was like, now there is a bigger social good movement. And so Games for Change being a good example of that. And so can you hang these things out there and say, let's create a game that a, the design process makes you more empathetic and learn through the game design process, but as a motivator, because there's kids out there that are not going to get to care about doing these other projects, but if you make it about social good, um, you might pull that in. And again, they might not normally be the ones who would be drawn towards making a game, because that's not really their thing, but if you make it about social good and then the benefits of having to make a game, it's, it does do some good deep learning and empathy and just sort of the systems thinking and things like that, that maybe they wouldn't have engaged in if it was just a game. But if you make it about something in the community, um, they can come all in. Um, I've had that same experience, so um, teaching college classes for game development. Um, I've done them just for computer science students, and I've done classes where we had projects for change uh, just for sophomores, and also for uh, cross-listed classes between education and computer science, uh, graduate students and undergraduates. Um, and it's, it's true, not, not everybody wants to make a game. Even, even people who sign up for a class don't necessarily want to do all the parts. Um, I think that's one thing I've seen, at least in, the, in some of the workshops we've done and also in the literature, is um, sometimes students who are really gung-ho come in and they find out that how much work it is uh, to make a game and they don't really like all of that. So that's why I really loved the first playable productions thing. Yeah. Uh, so you design it, someone else implements all of, the, all of that. Um, although I think the making itself also is a really good uh, learning process. Yeah, absolutely. But I like the spectrum. Games can be just the catalyst for everything, right? We had one project in, in Turkey where we worked with Syrian refugee children. And so they're in camps. They can't go to school because they don't have enough Turkish language skills, proficiency. Um, so we, we were given the opportunity to design a four-week curriculum for them. And um, we um, had um, my colleague, uh, Salçuk Sirin at, at New York University, had done a survey with those students to find out what their main issues, their main problems, their, their biggest needs were. And the needs were around mental health. Uh, they had all gone through trauma. The needs were around language learning and the needs were around positive outlook in life, right? So coding wasn't the first thing that they would have put on any survey. So what we did is we put a curriculum together that had Minecraft involved because there was some research that showed that Minecraft or games like that actually have, not in a clinical sense, but in a kind of more general sense, uh, some mental health benefits. Um, we had code.org um, to, to learn how to code, but that was separate from the game, right? So the computational skills that you get in code.org and what you actually do in Minecraft is related. So the Minecraft game became the catalyst to say, well, I, I do want to know how this works. And then we had a learning platform called Sarago to teach them uh, Turkish, and um, we had our executive functions games to, uh, for them to, to train executive functions uh, to have the cognitive skills to succeed. And uh, so we run this study and, and all indicators on mental health, on outlook on life, on coding, on language, they all, executive functions, they all went up after four weeks of two hours uh, only, uh, uh, you know, five days a week. And, and so there's, there's kind of this, this case to be made to say, yes, so that was not games for coding in the classical sense, but it was a whole curriculum where the, the games were the catalysts and the coding was something that came out of it. And I could envision that to feed back into reading, right? That to feed back into video production. All of that has been done, right? So where the games are not the, the primary object of what people do, but, but the reason for why they're doing all these other things. And that's what excites me, right? So that, that games, uh, Jim G talks about games with a capital G, right? Everything that happens around the game. And, uh, and so that's something that I think, um, you know, the, the game skeptics often forget that that's actually what's really interesting. Yeah. So Go ahead. There's a connection there to project-based learning, mm -hmm. which um, I'm, I meet a lot of teachers who say, oh, I have to do project-based learning, so I'm going to have to design this project and think of something for them to do and make a video <laughs> game. I mean, every time, just make a video game. It's going to be completely different every time. The steps are going to be different depending on the, what you concentrate on is going to be different. The way you organize your team is going to be different. Are we going to specialize and I'll do the code and you do the music? Or are we going to collaborate? Or are we going to do the music with code? Um, and it's, it's like we used to have, you know, the, the business and entrepreneurship project that you do, you know, the, the kind of milestone project all the eighth graders would do or something is create a business and a prototype and a project and everything. Video games is another one of those that like everyone should be doing at least once during their time in school. 
because the process is so deep and rich and it, it inspires you to try new things and to have new relationships with people and, and address kind of problems in a different way. Like my favorite thing about video games, like being a full stack developer myself, doing the code and the art and the marketing and the sound design and everything, is that I have had, I could bring all of my life experience into it. Like I am not a composer, but I took music theory when I was 10. So this game was, you know, the soundtrack to this game has a 10 year old level experience of music theory. <laughs> and that's good enough. Um, yeah. And so I really want, yeah, I really want <laughs> games to kind of encourage people not to, not to silo themselves, like, oh, I'm not, not going to work on the code because I'm only, you know, a, I'm only a sound person. I think having people engage across those disciplines is where games can really make people grow. I like the, the good enough thing because that harkens back to a previous talk that was in this room <laughs> and, and that goes along with the, the boundary of a game, right? So we have this much time to get this much game done. It's good enough for this. Um, and that brings me to another point I wanted to raise for the panel. Um, we have lots of different formats for making games, and I think uh, you wanted to say something about game jams as a format. Um, and I've done a lot of those, so I've participated in the Global Game Jam uh, eight times in uh, North Carolina, um, and think it's been a great format for college students to make games. What did you want to say about game jams? Well, let's do a survey first. Who's heard of game jams? Who's participated in a game jam? Okay, you all need to do it, it's amazing. Like one day or a weekend or something, everyone gets together and they just, there's a theme announced on the day, you don't plan ahead, and you just make something. And at the end you show it off to other people. And it's amazing because it has that good enough pressure. It's, we're doing this in a short time, so what is the most important part? And you end up with these games that are like, yeah, this is a game about, you know, ancient Phoenicians, but all the players are just squares, because that's as far as we got. <laughs> and that's cool, it's good enough, because the imagination of the player brings so much to the game. And that's one of the ways that, like, you can really push the, the innovation and the, you know, getting back to first principles, what's actually important about a narrative and about interaction and everything. And, um, I mean, I've, I've run a lot of game jams and hackathons, and I, I really think, like, having that time to work with other people who you don't know and just challenge yourself to learn new stuff, that's the time, like, that, that's how you get your 10,000 hours in. Yeah. Because just doing something during class or as an assignment or anything, you've got to just be given the free time. You have 24 hours, take your own breaks. I'm not going to write you know, a plan for you, do it yourself. And this can be done as young as like third grade. And it, it's just, it's fantastic. I encourage you. <laughs> and so, um, Eric, can you tell us um, anything related to that about the regional challenges that uh, you do with Alice? Still too early to say what I've learned. <laughs> No, I mean, part of what I saw there is that we will see a lot more in Alice where they do an interactive narrative or a storytelling because it does get hard to do game programming. So one of the things that I've been trying to come up with is lessons and testing them around for like, what does an interactive narrative look like and how does that help you understand if else and then what does that look like in Alice so that they really understand all the different ways they can use a conditional to mirror like the design patterns of a decision tree and a narrative, things like that. How do you do open world for then what does collision detection mean? And what does it mean for proximity and things like that? And make it very easy so they have the toolkit and then they can just design into these other patterns. And so I realized that I think I have less game submissions because I started all those lessons and put them on paper but never got them out to the teachers and things like that. Um, I guess one thing, just to <coughs> circle back a little bit, because I think this is something that I wanted to talk a little bit about was, there's a difference between, and this was talked about last night, what does it mean to design a game and use like a game star mechanic or a game salad where it's really just the success of making a game as motivation to then go learn Unity and deeper programming? Um, so some of that and then just understanding that when you're coming up with what you're going to do that there's sort of the three different silos or two that one is just whatever tool, it doesn't matter if they are really programming or learning programming. Um, one is then are they learning those conditionals and proximities and what are the underlying programming logic, but like they don't have to code it. You don't care if they ever code it, as long as they understand the principle because they can apply it later. And then what is the one where like, they are using a tool that is like a Unity, where they are learning how to program and that is the intention of, um, because I'm realizing that a lot of times we put all, try to put all three of those together, 
and then it's just straight overwhelming. And how can we pick the tool, understand what we want the outcome of the experience to be, and be a little bit more um, fluid on that or decisive on that so we know that this is meant for people that are ready to program, and these are ones where we just want them to conceptually get it, or we just want them to have a good, I designed a game, sweet, let's keep making the technology stuff. Um, and so sometimes that's getting mushed up. It's sort of the, like, I want to make a game for good. I want it to be both a marketing game, an educational game, and all these things. And it's like, yeah, no, 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 yeah. So on that uh, on that note, that's actually like the main theme of my game classes is do one thing well. Yeah. Pick pick what it's going to be yeah. and focus on that to the end. Game jam or whole semester or whatever is like pick that one thing that you're going to put your effort towards. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to the audience for questions. So we'll take questions uh, from the audience now. And if you don't have any, I have more. <laughs> yes. I have a question about how important it is. For game develop these game developers you've been talking about to actually have somebody play the game and give them feedback. Absolutely. Essential. Yes. <laughs> that is the most important. And we start that <laughs> we start that early. So um, I'll have kids have their developer hat and their player hat. And like separating that is really hard, especially for little kids. But if you actually have physical hats, then it's helpful. If you make them turn the computer around and play it on the other side of their desk, that kind of thing. So play testing as you're going, but then also with other people in the room, with other, we have this, um, like the buddy system, where the fifth graders design games for the first graders. So they go and they do the whole design thinking and, and get the requirements from the first graders. First graders are brutal. Because they'll get the prototype of the game back and they'll be like, that's not good enough. I actually, uh, we had, I mean, kids love to put their stuff on a projector, so I did one boot camp as part of our regional challenge where then I could have people help them code stuff and things like that, and I could get a sense of what was going on. So we intentionally called it like the puppy tank instead of the shark tank yeah. to try and make it a little bit better. <laughs> feel better about coming in here and sharing your world with everybody. Um, but yeah, it's so much better in terms of like just the benefit of them doing it, getting like them out of their shell. I mean, from the ETC, all that stuff. All of those get into the process and more just the earlier you can get them used to critique or helping think through other people's problems and then taking that back to their projects. So yeah, the puppy tank. I love that question. Thank you so much. The, the way we approach it is um, in, in similar ways, but the way we talk about it is that, you know, there's a lot, talk, a lot of talk about design thinking and being a designer empowers you to change the world around you, right? But we think there is uh, not enough emphasis and, and we use the term research thinking. Uh, so I want you to think of yourself as a designer with a researcher, with the heart of a researcher, where I can not only change the world around me, I can also employ very simple methods to find out if that worked the way I wanted it to. And those very simple methods are the playtesting methods we're talking about, right? But if we really give you that identity or help you form that identity of a, a researcher, you know, and that doesn't mean the academic researcher that has to write these big grants and otherwise we can't do any research. Research could just mean to talk to five people and just like they learn in middle school, use the scientific method to, to make sure that they're, they're following the right steps for that. Which, by the way, for many will be the first time that the scientific method has any real life implications for them, <laughs> other than measuring the length of whatever they are, their gummies are, the, the gummy bear, you know, uh, uh, and um, and so so the the research thinking part, where we teach them very simple methods of of uh, play testing and then have them act them out. It's like the turning around the computer, putting on a different hat, but naming it. Right. That has been really important for us. Yeah, and so I do the same thing in my class. So we have um, every two to three weeks, we have a presentation and the game teams have to present and they have rubrics for those presentations and the rest of the class gives feedback. So that's how we kind of do critiques. Because when I first started doing game courses, uh, computer science students don't take critiques from woman professor very well. Uh, but they do from the rest of their class. So I take all the rubrics that I collect electronically on Google Forms and then post a chart of how they did. And I get no feedback of like, oh, I don't believe you that my game sucks. Uh, well, everyone else said that your game sucks, so not my, <laughs> not my problem. Um, but we, we have, I'm joking about that. We have a rubric that's like, you know, did they say the one thing they were going to do well? Do you think they can do this in this amount of time? Did they convince you? You know, did they say who was going to do what part of the game? Um, and did they give you a timeline? That kind of stuff is what we do in, like each time we have a presentation. And I actually came at the same 
focus uh, on games uh, research from the beginning is that I always saw making games and making them for a purpose as a way to ask a research question. Like, can I make a game to change something? And then focus on what that thing is and then make a, some kind of assessment to measure whether that uh, did. So my whole class always has that. Like, so they read a few papers on small papers on games that have been for a purpose and then uh, do their own play testing and their own uh, assessment of whether that thing changed that they wanted to from the game. Another question? Yes. I have a mic. Oh, great. My exercise in. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the connections with making game between making games and executive function development. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, executive functions development, um, for those who are not developmental psychologists, um, are basic cognitive skills that underlie our thought, our emotion, our action, our behavior, pretty much anything. Um, and they can be broken down in very sub-skills, and, and the easiest way to, to describe them is there's one sub-skill sub that is a cognitive flexibility sub-skill, and, and when rules change, how quickly can I accommodate that change? And there are really cute videos of three-year-olds who learn to play a game <coughs> sorting cards sort of ways, and you tell them five times, now we change the rules. And then you give them the new problem, they promptly do the, use the old rule. So it's actually a, a hard thing to change uh, the way we uh, um, apply rules. The second one is working memory. That's a pretty straightforward one. The third one is inhibitory control. And inhibition, uh, the best way to explain that is if you are a politician in an important office and you feel the urge to tweet at three in the morning and if you had inhibitory control you would realize that that might have national security or worldwide implications and you might not. Uh, I'll, I'll go with that far. Um, the, um, the, the videos that you see on, on YouTube is about um, uh, um, delay of gratification when you put a cupcake in front of kids and you tell them if they get another one. You know, that's inhibiting the urge to to do what you want to do right away in favor of a, a more favorable response, which is not to eat it and you get another one later. So how does that relate to game design? Um, when you think about a team, when you think about collaborating with others, when you think about inhibiting wanting to jump in right away um, and in favor of letting the other person speak, when you realize your, your game design might have just changed entirely and you were still stuck on the platformer idea, but now we're doing something entirely different. And when you realize that you have to hold all of the, those ideas in working memory, um, there is a very clear relation to that. Um, EF developed over a long time. It starts in kindergarten and before. It's something where uh, more affluent parents have clearly more means to give their children those opportunities. And so what, what the developmental psychology community is trying to do is to kind of give those who didn't have the opportunities uh, early on in their childhood um, ways of, of having that opportunity. And we focus on games that we designed for that. We designed three games, one for each sub-skill, and we're doing research studies on that. Um, so it is a basic cognitive skill. It translates into school performance. It translates, when, you, when you look at EF in early childhood and kindergarten, you can predict the entire trajectory for, for the life success. It's a very scary thing that that is such a strong predictor. Um, so, um, that, so the relationship is uh, game design is one way of doing it. Uh, because of all of its complex components. Um, dance or any other martial arts is another way of doing it. Uh, so there are a, a lot of different things where you would want to put a whole package together to, to train yet and develop yet. Thank you. Thank you. My next answer to that, because that was an amazing answer that covered most of it. But it made me think of another thing that we do that's related to the last question is all of our grad students have to take improvisational acting. Mm -hmm. um, and partly for that yes and, so when they have to work in a group, also to get them used to being embarrassed and terrified so they can do their pitches, um, those types of things. And so some of that of just rules change very rapidly in uh, improvisational acting, and then yes, and then here there's things like that. Right. Just a side note. Other questions? I think this one was... Oh. Hi. I'm Marty. Um, I teach seventh grade coding class. Um, I am not a game developer by training. I'm not a programmer by training. I just saw this as something that was important to try to do. And as I continue to develop my class, I'm giving my students more and more freedom in terms of what their projects are going to be to the point where now I have uh, 
at the end of one of my units where they can develop anything they want. Often it ends up being a game. And one of the struggles that I have is moderating their expectations of themselves. This has been a ter kind of, I mean, I'm gonna be real honest, it's kind of a terrifying opportunity that for me to give them, because I'm always worried that they're going to come up with a question that I don't know how to answer. I don't know how to help them with this. And then we spend 20 minutes trying to figure it out, or, or sometimes three days or four days, trying to figure out how to do this one little thing. So I'm wondering if you, since this is your world, do you have any um, suggestions for somebody like me about how do I help the students moderate their expectations of themselves? Like, and I'm coming to it, if you talked about the different perspectives of how are we going to approach it. So my approach is I want my students to actually be using the structures of programming in order to create whatever it is they want to build. So when they come to me and say, I want to build an open world networked, uh, you know, okay, you know, we're like six weeks into an introductory <laughs> graphical block, block based programming. Uh, how do I get them, how do you suggest getting them to understand what their abilities are and still feel successful? Yeah, I mean, just the other one is, so the kid I really want to engage in that after school program comes up and he's super excited and he's like, yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I love football. I want to program football. And you're like, that is like the hardest game. <laughs> <laughs> and when you right, say, hey, that's the problem. Physics, right, that's what I'm talking about. How is this stuff going on? Uh, that doesn't answer the question. <laughs> I mean, some of that from mine when I'm thinking about these lessons or design things is like, get them into doing some design lesson first where it's a, this is very much an on-rails interactive narrative and this is how you design it. This is an open world and these are the components you would have to program to do it to try to rein them in so that they just don't go off and design something that you can't fundamentally help them support that you couldn't even help them sort of analyze and break down into how you're right. programming it and those types of things. So as much as you want it to be wide open, you kind of have to put them in parameters. And I guess some of the things that's good if you want to use like, this is how it happens in the real world is that you know, a mobile dev studio is going to say, well, what platform are we going to use? What are the limitations of the game mechanics we're allowed to support? And we're going to design a game to that. And that's a very professional thing to do. So you can say, like, I love you want to do a game. How about we stick with, like, here's your game mechanics. Here are the platforms we're going to support. And let's be that studio so that you intentionally take off, like, uh, open world, all <coughs> open physics, everything from, like, the design challenge as a way to try to stop that. Yeah, let me add another answer to that. So uh, one of the things I've had my students do is to go out to K-12 schools and teach game workshops and yeah. after school game programs and Saturday game programs. And when they first, we, we were using Game Maker to begin with. And uh, if you've never used it, the very first version of it was awesome with like lots of very good tutorials for making different kinds of games. Like something you were saying you needed for Alice is like platformer, arcade, side scroller, you know, this, that, uh, different kinds of games. And so they had a lot of different um, already made ones you could start from. And they would take that and do a workshop and then kids would want to do something, but it would need a lot of tailorization even from one of those. And they couldn't t teach all of those to everybody, right? So right. they would teach a little intro and then say, okay, now go make a game. And then they would all come up with an idea. Um, and I also did like some camps for, um, some students that came from universities in Korea, I would do a three week game design and development camp and we were using um, 3D Game Studio, which was a long time ago. Um, and they would wanna do something that was, you know, the engine didn't support. And then you end up saying, okay, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna work on that and you might work on it all night. And I still couldn't get like one game. They wanted the, the character to be able to run on the ceiling and the gravity, just the way it worked in that thing. Like it didn't matter if I turned the vectors all correct. It wasn't working. Um, so you can try to adapt it, but what my students decided to do when they were teaching these after school programs was to frame the entire experience differently. So they chose, they were like, everyone's gonna make a maze game and we're gonna emphasize the narrative aspect of this. So what you're going to do is come up with your characters and a story and these are the mechanics we're going to use so that they didn't have to support like six different kinds of, um, really different kinds of games. And that's a good skill for the t your teams if you do allow them to choose different tools or make totally different types. Like part of what they need to do is to make an argument that the game they wanna make fits with the affordances of the tool that they chose. 
right? So if you can say, you want to make open worlds? Well, we have Scratch. Right. So, you know, what's going to be a good open world in the context of Scratch? And having them define that is, you know, giving them the challenge of that is something. Or you could say, frame it, okay, here's the tool we're going to use, and here's the mechanics, and let's, let's focus on the story or the characters or the, you know, and, and we've done that, and at citizen schools, at the end of that, they have a wow where they present what they made, and the kids often, you know, all of them actually really buy that idea, like, oh, we're really talking about the story of this, and we, we learned how to make a maze game, but our character is this, and this is why they have to fight this giant candy bar at the end, and, you know, whatever it is that they've made, and they, they'll buy into it, so if you frame it the right way, they'll buy in, or you can say, this is your job to figure out how to make something that fits within the time that we have and within the tools that you have. And um, I really like the context of kind of giving them complete freedom. But yes, they don't know what they can, what they can do and what they can't do. And that's part of the learning process. Um, but like as a game dev, I always come to this. Because you know, let's make a game, they go, I'm going to make Clash of Clans. Right. No, you aren't. Yeah. <laughs> um, a game is not built from start to finish. It's not from intro screen, choose your character, to navigate the world and put on your armor and then walk around. It's not built like that. It's built from the inside out. So first you start with, how do I control a character? How do they move in the world? Or, you know, how, am I placing things or destroying things? The central mechanic, the what I'm going to be doing all the time, and it's usually what I'm going to do with the mouse or the keyboard or the controller. Like, what's the interface? And if you have that and that's as far as you get, cool, you have a thing that works. And then you build a world. Yeah. And then you go back to the interaction between the player and the world. If that works, cool, you're done. But if someone just starts with the intro scene, choose your character, and that's as far as they get, that's not a game. Inside out. That's yeah. kind of been my strategy so far, is I have been telling them again and again and again, we only have five hours for something that might take somebody two years. So exactly. it's OK if it doesn't work. You yeah. know, Let's see how far you can get, but yeah. Another thing I tell them is, what you, what's your favorite game? And they'll go, uh, Fortnite. I go, okay, <laughs> how many people do you think worked on Fortnite? And they'll say something, you know, more than two, right? And say, so, okay, how long do you think they worked on it? More than two days, right? So you multiply that, did it take two people more than two days? Yeah, how much time do we have? Two hours? Are you going to make Fortnite? And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I can make my favorite part out of Fortnite, yeah. the part where you get to change your armor, right? And that, that's worthwhile. They that's, a good, that. that's a good strategy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that framing is really good too. So that's a different framing. So in my class, we do functional minimum and first playable, <laughs> and then and we have you know uh, intermediate, and then we have alpha, then we have gold, which is not really gold, but you know. Um, so having levels of like uh -huh. this is how much you get done, and kind of giving them that idea. This is what a game studio does too. They get that, you know, what's the main game mechanic? Get that working. You know, get one place where it looks nice to do that. You know, you don't need 15 levels. You just need one, um, that sort of thing. Thank you. I think we have a question here. Hi, so I, I teach a game development module at an after-school makerspace, and um, something that I've sort of struggled with for the past two years that I've been teaching this course is that a lot of the youth that go through the course, their favorite games involve like a first-person shooter, and we have um, a rule in our space that we can't have that in any, we can't have weapons in anything that we make. Um, and because we don't, we want it to be a safe space for, for everyone. Um, and when I reinforce that during the game development module, like these kids get really bummed out because they're like, well now I can't make anything that I like. Um, so I was sort of wondering if you guys had any suggestions about how to, um, enforce that rule without it seeming like a, like a limitation on their imaginations? I have a quick answer that I'm sure you have different ones at different levels. So I have the same rule in my summer research. So I've had students come in my lab and make games for a summer. And one student came in and he happened to be our chancellor's son at the time. And you know, I was like, here's the rule. You can't make violent games in here, no shooting. And, and I said, you can, you can do things like you can aim the thing at a thing and you can then change the thing. And he's like, I want to shoot bunnies that are evil, and I want to change them into blood splats. And I'm like, you cannot change them into blood splats. <laughs> so, you know, he was trying to get my abstraction there. Um, 
but then he actually ended up making a, a game where he shot healing gas at evil bunnies and they turned into happy bunnies. And then, and he got back at me because at the end of each level it said, number of bunnies who would have preferred to stay evil. Yeah. And he <laughs> randomly generated a, a number. So, you know, we're trying to get kids to be creative. So I tried to turn the you can't shoot stuff into, you could shoot something, but it just can't be to kill it. Yeah. Uh, but maybe there's some other ideas here. So the the game paradigm, like the architecture where the game generates like a pseudo-random sequence of enemies that then the player destroys, that is the easiest architecture to implement. Mm -hmm. And so it's always the first thing people want to go to because it's like, okay, it's easy to make stuff, easy to destroy. But creation is really hard. And that's kind of what we're looking at in the, you know, the AAA game space. That's why Minecraft was such a game changer. Because now I can build stuff and I go away and it's still there. It changes over time and it becomes better. So looking at the creation rather than destruction dichotomy is one of those that like, that's what I really want people to get up to in real game development. But at a lower level when kids are just engaging with game dev for the first time, that's too much. Like they're gonna need to use the architecture where they create stuff and then destroy it. But it doesn't have to be, um, I, always, I always try to reframe the problem for them. So like if you have stuff coming through you know, at you and you need to solve the problem of it, what are you going to do? Not by destroying it, but what, by helping it. So I like the idea, we always end up like feeding things. <laughs> you know, throw food at something so it's happy and it goes away. Or um, the Pokemon uh, idea. I love when Pokemon came out and it was about photographing a thing. So you, you have to catch a thing in your sights and aim it and everything, but it's not, it's not about destroying that thing, it's about, you know, taking a picture of it so you can keep the memory. Um, and it, it does seem a bit oppressive. Um, I deal with this all the time because I, I teach all around kids of all ages. I want to shoot stuff. Um, well, okay, that's your first idea. What's your second idea? But I, I do want to push back slightly. We have agreed uh -huh. on everything so yeah. far, so you've got to push back on something. Um, <laughs> Fortnite is, for good reason, one of the most uh, uh, successful games right now. And I've been watching my 14-year-old play it, and I was very uneasy about it at first because we believe in the same thing, right? One shouldn't kill people. But, but it's occurred to me that there's another way of looking at it, which is Fortnite is another way of playing tag, right? Yes. You're out. And it's not graphic violence, and there's no blood spots splashing all over the screen. So there is a question on how you implement it. And we don't do it either for obvious reasons. But I feel we're, we're a bit too much still in this paradigm of the brutal killings in, a, in, a, in some games, and there are horrific games that I wouldn't let my kids play. But then there are other ways of doing that, and it is deeply satisfying to point something at another object player, whatever, and, and uh, affect change in that person. And we feed aliens, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, because we want to go to middle schoolers. But when, when <coughs> you know, um, I was in the school and the second graders were looking at our games and they're like, I, li I like to play Fortnite. I'm like, second graders, you play Fortnite and your parents let you, right? So it's, it's a different mm -hmm. paradigm now, and, and I do be believe that, you know, if we think of it as just with all these other things, there's a, there's a whole spectrum of what it means to, to point a weapon at a, another being. Um, you know, we can't play tag, it's, it's not, but it's, there is a, there's a parallel to that. And we, we need to, I think, bring the awareness to them as designers. And there's a, a great um, project by Mary Flanagan and Helen Nissenbaum um, that is called Values at Play, right? What are your values that you as a developer put into a game? There's a whole book out and there's a whole card deck out where you can uh, incorporate that into your design. And uh, I know this doesn't really solve your question because you have that policy. So the answer for you would be feed them. Um, we, have, we have one game, the inhibition game, uh, we smash avocados and you get guacamole in the end, right? So you actually <laughs> do something good. So it's a whack-a-mole turned avocado smashing kind of game. Um, but the poor avocados, I mean, we, we actually had that question, will people be traumatized by smashing those well, avocados? Did they put faces on the avocados? We did put faces oh. on the avocados, <laughs> and some people call them penguins, which is, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, it, it, it's a complex question. I mean, ours was, so the doesn't always work, but is that a first-person shooter is the easiest game to design, you're better than that. Try to bait and switch them on that. Then a lot of what they talked about, we saw lots of fireman worlds, things with flashlights. But so then it's just like, go through the thing of like, what are the game mechanics in the first person shooter? The first one is just skill. 
So is it about you being better than the person and pointing at something faster? So then list me out all the mechanics that can do that and try and challenge them on those. Mm -hmm. The other is ammo versus number of um, enemies or something like that. So like how do you design a game that has the same level of concepts of scarcity and using something to achieve something? So really it's a, a chance to get them to think about what are the mechanics of a first person shooter because there are much deeper game mechanics in a first person shooter. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are just, that means you want to make a skill based game or you want to make a resource based game or like what are some of those things. Or do you want to make a but, game that conveys a certain emotion? Like a lot of kids were totally into Five Nights at Freddy's because it was scary. So they go, I'm going to make Five Nights at Freddy's. It's like, okay, well, you know, mm -hmm. do that calculation for how many people, how many dates. But what did you like most about it? They always said because it was scary. Okay, let's make a scary game because it doesn't have to be. So, then, yeah, so once I saw that, it was like flashlight. That monsters come at you, and you have to make sure to have light on it to keep them in base. So I have a first-person type shooter. It is a scary concept, but I am not killing. I am just keeping the boogeyman at bay. That kind of thing. Um, I just want to mention the tools you, you use. Yeah. I just want to shoot stuff. And, yeah. yeah, the tools you use <laughs> yeah. though can make a difference, right? So if you're teaching them Unreal, they're going to shoot stuff. I mean, because that's what the mechanic is that's built in. I think like a large part of it too is that they want to make a, a weapon. Like it's not even so much about like the blood or the carnage or whatever. Like, like they want to make like, an assault yeah. weapon. Yeah. I think we have another question, but yeah. This led me to think about uh, this question. As you, this was a phenomenal question, but I, I I've heard you all talk about different games. Um, so I use, I, I, I always put it this way, I use kind of any good tool to kind of hook and crook my kids to get them turned on to code. Um, so gaming is one component, one mechanism. We're focusing on cyber citizenship, so if you can think of three types of games and an example of platforms that uh, would facilitate this cyber citizenship or being just a good neighbor online type of behavior. Could you share each of you like at least three different ones? Um, that would be like super, super cool, like awesome for me. <laughs> I mean, so I will just do on there that if you don't know of Games for Change, do you know of Games for Change? No. So Games for Change is an organization that is just all about social good gaming and things like that. And so they give out awards every year and they have a whole list of games on their site and that's where you'll find stuff like the redistricting game or iCivics and things like that. So lots of games that are out there that a lot of people don't know about that are just educational games on lots of different subject matter. So that is a good resource of a place to go where instead of giving you three, you can sort of explore those <coughs> at your leisure. Because uh, yeah, when I mean, there's bunches of different things just in terms of, you know, do you want the dark, like, papers, please, or something like that, which is a game that will teach you about immigration, but it's kind of dark and things like that, or do you want a happier education? Like, there's just so many things that I think it'll depend on sort of your kids. Um, we just want them to be made really nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because, I, like, this is a personal story. I have a friend in December. Her son was shot because her his wife, uh, his wife uh, spoke bad about a rapper in the city, and unfortunate in our community, you know, anybody, that's his name and his identity, that's all he have, he's, he's not educated, right? And so he put a hit on this guy. He had, his children were in the barber shop at the time, and he was getting their hair cut. This is horrible. So this, I mean, it has really bad consequences. So we want them to think about, as you, said, you know, what are the consequences about some of the things? So that's good. Send me, give me another one. Um, okay. I want to mention, uh, in that context, it reminds me of uh, the Microsoft Imagine Cup. So they'll have a competition to get people to make games to solve particular problems. So that might be something you might want to think about. It's not just to play a game, but have the students think about making a game that would explore that really stressful environment, right? So having them think about like what is it that might have caused you know that person to go you know put a hit on that other person and having the students actually kind of make narrative based games uh, about what 
does happen, what should happen, how should they, you know, how should people behave, and having those discussions. That's what you want them to have. And they could make their own games around that using some different tools. Um, there are some, I know that there's some research-based games that came out of uh, UC San Diego um, that were like high school gossiping kind of games um, that, that might be related so that they do have some models. So underneath them, they have models of the characters, how they should behave. Um, and so the only things I think of when you talk about that are research games. Um, so Games for Change is a good place to look. Um, but like different competitions sponsored around the world for things um, would be another place. And indie games, a lot of times they'll explore new mechanics for things like that. Um, one of my, my first PhD student, Evie Powell, started a game company, uh, Verge of Brilliance, and she prototyped a game that, that no one wanted to fund on, on Kickstarter, um, but it was uh, about police brutality, and it was a RPG where you are, uh, you just came out of the police academy and you're um, a cop, and you know, you get reports, and you know, oh, there's a black kid hanging out in the park, and you go to the park, and you have choices of actions to do, but if you do anything that's reasonable, um, the game just doesn't work. In order to win, you have to do things that would be bad. Um, it's just pointing out that like the way it's sort of like the culture of the police place that you're in, um, and then like you're supposed to follow your orders, and there's people complaining, and you need to do something, and you need to look, safe face. Uh, so that's the kind of thing you want your students talking about, right? Because you don't want them to just you don't want to smooth over it and just say, be nice all the time, because you might get shot. That's, that doesn't feel authentic, right? It's not real. It's not talking about the real fear they may have of living in a community where that could be the repercussion of their behavior, right? So you want them to explore, like, what is that? That's, like, terrifying, right? You want them to explore that, not just the, let's all be nice, because otherwise we're going to die. Well, the good thing about it, you just mentioned your it would be the same thing. I mean, it's the same, um, you know, sometimes we think in America that our problems that we deal with are so quite unique. But if you look all around the world, and they're not necessarily African Americans or black and brown community, there are other, uh, maybe class caused the problem, or money, you know, in this case, Palestine, Israel. I'm pretty sure they're dealing with lots of problems that are quite similar. Um, I want to make a case real quick. I know it might seem lateral, but mini metro. Mini metro. Yeah, it's, you have to design a subway system for like these little shapes that are people. But as soon as you get into it, you think, oh, which people have more of a right to transportation and which don't? Like, who is going to be a priority? And who can I, you know, I can send them on a loop and everything. And at the same time, um, there's that plane landing game. Do they still have that? Yeah. Flight control. Right. Yeah, and you it, it puts you in the place of making choices about who's more important and who's not, and then that's from a place that you can think about why did I devalue that type of person? Mm -hmm. It's very in a very abstract way because they're just shapes, but <laughs> but it strikes me that when problems run so deep, the game really can only be the catalyst yeah. for communication and for other problems. Yeah, and it would be a very heavy expectation on any game to. You know, you play the game and you're a changed person. Uh, that doesn't work when it's a violent game, it doesn't make you violent. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work when it's an a, a empathy inducing game. The game alone will not result in, in more empathy. It's what goes around it, right? How you embed it, how you do, you know, what curriculum you structure, what experiences. Yeah, um, and who you're playing with. Yeah. So, multiplayer games that the kids have to engage with each other and like, essentially use game theory and retaliation, that is a great place to start. Be like, well, why did you do that to me? Well, because you cheated on me last time, and I can't, I don't, can't think of any specific games about that. But I mean, down to Uno. I just played one of those. Uh, there's a project I just saw. It's called Homefront. So they do it's like PTSD for uh, soldiers, essentially. So tying experience, and now the project that I saw was doing board games related to it to essentially take Greek. Um, stories that are very much about war and coming back a lot of the same things because these things, like you said, they sort of transcend time, a lot of them, the core underpinnings, um, and make it about either watching a play or having a board game experience that then elicits a conversation to get at the deeper issues. So here's some examples of that. Um, where are you located? Arizona. 
So one thing, and this is just because I think it's amazing and sort of scary at the same time, this is tangential to games, but there's a group in Chicago that essentially is monitoring social media to then look for trending things to then um, predict when something might happen in the community and then send out community um, alerts. Yeah, and just interventions from community leaders and things like that. So of course, the, the scary part of me is that obviously the police want to get at this data and it becomes very much minority mm -hmm. report. Um, but it's something that they're doing to help try and track social media and see when things might break out in the community. And so I don't know if anybody in your neighborhood is doing that or could reach out to that organization, but I thought that was sort of amazing. Yeah, Obviously this incident happened in Louisiana, uh, which is, you know, quite African-American China city of the world. So it was there. I think uh, Jens had a question next. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to take Jan up on something you just calmly mentioned in passing that, uh, you know, good games don't make good persons, such as, you know, violent games don't make you violent. And, you know, if that is a proven fact, as it may seem, it strikes me as um, a little bit funny that we're prohibiting violent games when that is, in fact, what kids want to do. So I was remembering when Scratch first came out, you know, on the forums, I was one of the first moderators, uh, and we could clearly recognize like when the sun went up in Israel and, and Palestine, because that's when all the violent games would come. You know, these were people in a war zone making games about living in a war zone. So it occurs to me that, um, and I, I like your thoughts on that, that it's a double standard in a very violent society. We're banning playing games about violence, where in fact we're not banning the real thing. Um, it ought to be the other way around. I, I completely agree, and yet, so as a game designer, and as a researcher, um, there has long been this, we strongly believe violent games don't make you violent, but we also just as strongly believe that the games we design for empathy make you more empathetic, right? You can't have it done. It either goes one way or the other way. Now, of course, a violent game is not embedded, hopefully, in a culture of violence that then magnifies what you're learning in the game, versus an empathy game will hopefully be embedded in that but kind of context, game. right? <laughs> um, so, so from that perspective, uh, I completely agree. As a parent, you know, if my middle schooler came home and said, hey, guess what we're playing in school, um, I would find that at least something that I would want to be involved in to understand why there is violent mechanics in the game. But on the other hand, he comes home and he plays those games that I help him select and so on. So we're, we're as a society, um, sometimes overly protective when we have other goals that override what we otherwise believe in as a choice of freedom, right? And so if you want to have a safe space, you really want to not have that in that safe space. But at the same time, you know, that needs to transfer into the real world and the real world isn't a completely safe space. And so we want you to actually get the skills to operate in that space that is unpredictable and, and not safe. And yeah, it is a real dilemma and it's a real ethical problem people are wrestling with. And um, I can't blame anybody to say we don't want to do it. Um, I know that if I want to do any research study in a school, uh, no school board will ever approve a game that is violent, right? But from a, from a philosophical perspective, it's wrong because of exactly the reasons that you've mentioned. But it would require a level of supervision and of care that we often don't have the personnel to do. And a choice. Like, you really have to opt in. In a school setting, if everyone's making games and one person's allowed to make a violent one, and then we have this thing where everyone goes and, and bets each other's games, that's not great. But if it's just on scratch, and voluntary, opt in, you play this game if you want to, then that's very much a different setting and a different game. This goes back to my bullying quandary too, of saying, is it a game about a bullying or is it about somebody venting their frustration by making this game to represent their narrative? Mm -hmm. So like that's the other layer. It's like, are they making it because they need to get this out and this is their reality and so it is actually good that they express some of this stuff through creating a game and they're actually creating their personal narrative. It just, from our perspective, um, but then you don't know their motivation. Like, are they putting it out there because they want that to exist and be able to play it, or are they doing it because they need to get their story out? And 
some gray areas in there. So. I think there's something about authenticity coming out here in terms of um, what we talked about earlier is that you know we all believe in using uh, game design and development to help develop empathy and social skills and I think that the authenticity tie there is like you're like okay in Israel the kids are making these violent games but that is what they wake up to and that may be different than the context where we're making games you know in a school it's safe and and like I said we're having people play each other's games uh, but I, I went to Haiti in 2012 and we uh, taught BYOB which was the predecessor of SNAP which you work on um, to some young people there and we asked them to tell stories about their life and what problems they had. They weren't violent, but that, that's authentic, right? So if you're in the context of tell your narrative, then that makes sense. But if it's just because this is what the coolest, most latest game is, um, I think that's maybe not a good enough excuse for the kids to be creative, right? Because all of us are trying to promote creativity. And also design, like limited design choices doesn't mean you're not allowing freedom, right? Um, we all know that actually it's the limits that make us creative. And so saying you can't make a shoot 'em up game just means that, okay, don't copy the thing you played last night. Um, and, and they can stretch and grow. So I think that there's a balance there between authenticity and creativity and those boundaries there. And, and it's important to think about those in the context that you're in. And Sandy had a question, uh, but can we, can we take one last question? So I'm going off on a different track here. <laughs> um, so I teach at the high school level. I teach um, both AP courses. And uh, a woman in our uh, applied arts department wanted to add a game design course, which she has, um, to maybe interest some students who'd be afraid of AP to start with, or um, also freshmen who don't have that option. And it's become popular. However, in the two years she's offered it, there's been a total of one female who has signed up for it. Um, which is making it even harder for me to try to make the AP a little more equitable. Um, and I don't think she's doing a bad job. I don't think the class itself is the problem. I don't know if you have any suggestions about how to maybe promote or advertise that class. Um, or is there, I mean, she, she calls the class game design. I don't know if there's a better term. I don't know if it's in the description. I guess I'm just looking for help because I do think that, I mean, when I have the kids make games in my class, in the AP classes, the girls are just fine with it because they're given the opportunity to go all different directions. So it's not like they can't or don't want to do it. But it was amazing, as soon as she put that name on there, the boys flock to it and the girls won't touch it. Well, no, you have the solution built in because you have all the games that the girls made last year. But it's not in her class. No, but show them, use those games as the advertisement for this is the type of games that are. And the students. Uh, yes. And so you say, okay, everyone, not, okay, so letting everyone sign up for a class sight unseen is not going to get equity. They need the advertisement or the experience or the workshop that goes before in order to see what this kind of thing is, and that needs to be compulsory. So if you have like an assembly or a whatever that everyone sees, and if they see, oh, that's the kind of thing you need, they're much more likely to, to opt into it. Um, and we are definitely looking at that, like the pipeline coming up is going to get better and better. You're right. gonna have kids with more and more CS experience coming in. That's what and, I'm and equity, if you just sit on it a bit, the equity problem is gonna get better, um, but you can attack it through this side, just really through advertising and modeling. And but the hardest part we have is the students when they sign up are not even in our school. Yes, yes. And that's what's so hard. Some of the teachers, yeah. Too. That that's, can work. Some of the teachers idea. that have worked with me that do recruiting, um, they'll take their current students to the middle school that's feeding in mm -hmm. and, and have them demonstrate some of the cool projects that they made. And so even if the, you know, the games are not from the game design course, actually having the girls that made games and some African Americans, Hispanics, whoever you've got that looks diverse. Um, also, you might want to think of diversity in different ways, like people on the football team, cheerleaders, uh, the really Absolutely. popular kids, that's what one of the, Seth Reichelson is one of our BJC teachers and he's got like, you know, six sections of the AP course at his school when it started out with zero. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he has these strategies like when you have this fair where people sign up for classes, you know, have puppies, um, <laughs> get the football players and cheerleaders to take your class, like recruit them and be like, hey, you should come take my class. And then when you get a woman or a girl, say, 
get your friends to come take the class with you. You know, so if you get one, get a couple more, and then take those popular or cool looking kids down to the next level and have them talk about how cool this class was and what opportunities it gave them. And that's why we're really not having a problem at the higher level class. We're having a problem at this intro yeah. level class. But, but I want to put my, my researcher hat on real quick and say that is a research thinking opportunity, right? A survey to those who, who had the opportunity, saw the announcement, but opted out uh, to ask them why they chose not to. Or um, to, to, in general, a survey to those who would be the audience for that, what they're looking for in a class. And then to communicate that. Um, I think there's a lot of insights to be gained, or interviews, um, insights to be gained by talking to those who, who didn't choose the class. Even though the popular kid in the class probably has, has a, a good poll, but just in terms of understanding what the, what the interests are. Well, and it amazes Anything. me how they know who's in, like, they're like, you didn't take that class. That's not from that class. <laughs> like, they, they know. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, to his, I love it. They're like, why the girls that had fun making a game then opted not to? I think it, it's a question of not knowing, um, and that's why you want to educate the kids coming in. But we do have to end there. Thank you for your excellent question.